It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. That guy is Lars Fredrickson. I'm Dennis Farrell. We have John Hennigan coming up here in a few minutes with MLW. We can't wait. But little birdie told us your favorite segment is the questions, and we've got them all. So we're going to get to them. You like that little birdie told me? We Yeah. We, uh, I, yeah. I did get what kind, of, what kind of bird is it? Is it a fucking vulture? Uh, it's a Sean Ross Sap bird. He, oh. told me, he told me he's gotten a few emails about how uh, our our segments here, the question and answer segments is people's favorite. So okay, you got to give them what they want. Maybe we'll just bump John Hennigan and answer questions all night. That's, you that's know, we, we can't we can't we can't do that because John Hennigan is one of my good friends. Well, he's a good friend. He's a friend. He's okay. a friend. One of them. And yes. And I wouldn't bump John, you know, this, we're not David Letterman, Dennis. <laughs> Thank God. Um, I just want to let you know that Rance had got bumped for the Dave Matthews band on David Letterman. Oh, man. So, I mean, I, if it was like Kiss or like Slayer, cool. But Dave Matthews, bro, come on. I'm no one's ever heard of him and after that anyways, right? <laughs> no, uh, but kudos to Dave Matthews. Go ahead. Anyways, uh, go ahead. Let's 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 hit some questions. Jake from Lansing, Michigan. I seen Lars tweet a few weeks ago about the AEW video game. Is he a gamer? I think you are, Dennis. Of course I'm a fucking gamer, but uh do you game? I do, but I it's the most of the games that I like. Um I like Candy the... Crush. No, 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 no. But I play Magic the Gathering, okay? And I play that uh, through, like, my iPhone. Um, I love that game. I just, I, you know, my kids turned me on to it, and I, so, I, so I play that game. But, like, the, as far as, like, PlayStation games, the wrestling games I'll play, some of the, like, FIFA I'll play. Um, uh, like, I love, like, Friday the 13th or... Um, I love how they're putting out those old Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle games, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like, for me, it, it's, I, I enjoy it, but it's not, I'd mother, I'd, I'm going to watch, sit down and watch an old Kung Fu movie from the seventies before I'm going to turn the PlayStation on. Okay. Which but I've yeah. been doing a lot of as of recent. Mike Speedball Bailey, honestly, has really got me, to fall in love with my Kung Fu movie collection again. That's awesome. I like that. Yeah. Isn't it's funny. Cause sometimes we make friends with these guys after like court Bauer and I text back and forth, which kind of blows my mind sometimes. And you leave uh, out of a podcast going, oh, maybe I'll hear from this guy. And sometimes, you know, we make friends with these guys. Sometimes we don't, but like I'll sit there and go, Wow, why is why is you know Brody King sending me texts about playing Call of Duty or something? You know, I would like I literally was just with Brody King and Dan Housen today. Last night we went and had dinner because they're you know AEW's in town, San Francisco, mm -hmm. and uh just was with them today because they wanted to go to a dim sum spot, and then we went to a toy store, and um, you know, it's they're just normal dudes, like I mean, they're just like nerds like us. I mean, you can't be a, if you're a professional wrestler and you're not a nerd, then you're probably not good at your job, <laughs> which uh, I love talking to the older and younger guys about that change in the locker room from playing video games to like are drinking and driving drunk and those old stories of the old, you know, well, I will, I will say like, I don't know if you caught AEW on I Wednesday did. night, but <clears throat> Christian's promo was probably one of the best promos that I've ever seen in recent days because it's true. A lot of, I think what he was saying, there was so much truth in it. And, uh, you know, I do feel like modern day wrestlers, uh, from what I understand, um, and, you know, when I've sort of been around and see, they don't want to, you know, they, they do treat certain aspects of the business as a video game. And I think that some of the best wrestling stories have been always one part truth. So I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, people understand how awesome that was. All right. Joey wants to know, how do you both feel about matches, uh, about championship matches not closing out pay-per-views? I'm okay yeah. with it as long as it yeah. makes sense. 
Yeah, I, you know, I don't necessarily know. Like, if it's a big match and there's no championship involved and the, the story is greater than the championship, I feel like that should be, would be your your main event. I don't necessarily know if one thing has to be a main event. I feel like maybe the biggest angle that's going on generally is the main event. Um, unfortunately, there's not really, you know, a lot of storytelling that's happening in wrestling. Um, I think we, there's a couple things we can pull out of, of each. Uh, well, I can't even fucking go that far. I'd say Impact is probably the best storytelling wrestling, the be best, the purest wrestling show. I would say MLW is on par with that too. Um, I mean, when you think about the WWE, the only storyline that you've had from there is the bloodline that's been worth any kind of shit. Um, and that took Sami Zayn, right, to make it interesting for me. And I've said that the whole time. AEW, I don't think there really is a story that's that. I mean, the story that people fall follow is like from the media scrum on. That's the story that everybody's interested in. That company is like, you know, who's who's stabbing who in the back this week, you know, <laughs> like you know, or some shit like that. So, which is real life. So it's not even not playing out on their TV, you know. I, I don't know. I kid you not. The next question on my phone. Is from Amanda from Cincinnati. Uh, all the new rage of wrestling is media scrums. How do you feel yeah. about wrestling organizations having media scrums after pay per views? Okay, we're talking. Know. Well, here's the thing, and this is the context you have to look at and in, look into. So you're having a media scrum about an entertainment. It's not an actual. It's a sporting an event in sense in the sense that the wrestlers are athletes, right? Mm -hmm. so you're you're doing a media scrum as if it was like a, a fight or uh an mma thing or a baseball game or a football game or or whatever it is right but we it's a, it's it, we're having a media scrum on something that's predetermined that's a show okay and then you're hosting a bunch of wrestling uh journalists okay so that in itself is sort of like a oxymoron in a lot of ways, wrestling journalism. So I feel like, because there's a fine line because I mean, you know, some dirt sheet writers print rumor. So there could be not one speck of fact to the, what they're putting out on paper, but they still put it out there. So that's called, that's not really being a journalist, right? A journalist is somebody who actually finds the facts, gets it, um, you know, uh, uh, validated from one than more more than one so source, and then goes to print. Wrestling journalists, if you want to call them that, don't really do that. They sort of print the rumor, right? So they're getting it. They maybe get a call from whoever, maybe right, and then they're saying, "Well, this is what happened," and that's this guy's perspective on something that happened, or whatever it is. And so I, I don't necessarily know. I mean, even Dave Meltzer got you know sort of catfished when it came to his wrestling uh, journalism, you know, somebody pretending to be somebody from Japan, a wrestler. And it turned out that he was, you know, getting fucking, you know, you know, raped, you know, around it. So it's like, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if you can take it. It's not, I don't think it's a credible source of information. And I feel like it's, I don't know. It's, I don't I think any news outlet is a credible, you know, place for information. But you know what I'm saying? It's like I could do without it. Honestly, it's you know, we all know what wrestling is and we when why we watch it. I'm not going to spend 10, 15, 20 minutes after I watch something on TV to have to hunt it down on YouTube or wherever it's airing at that point and sit down and watch. I can go listen to everybody has a podcast. I'll go listen to everybody's podcast a day later if I really want to hear something in the media scrum because they're well, not going to tell you anything in it. No, and I think that, you know, I always have come from the place, uh, believe half of what you see and nothing of what you hear. And I think that you're pretty safe when you're in that place listening to news. Most of the truths that I know about professional wrestling have never been printed. Okay. So I've either getting it firsthand from the person that was there or both people that were there. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm not really one of those guys who's going to air somebody else's dirty laundry. Like it's clear to see who in the business 
prof of professional wrestling is the ones that you can trust and the ones that you can't trust. It's pretty clear to see. Is the other part of this rumor and falsehood and all this stuff, is that part of the entertainment now? Absolutely. So I can say, for instance, you know, I ran into Doink the Clown uh, in a urinal and uh, he put a bottle of vodka on the, the, I mean, Doink the Clown, sorry, you know, God rest your soul. But you know what I'm saying? Like, and I can go out and print this. He must be a drunk or whatever it is, right? Just because, and I don't even, but I did, I only, I only saw him put something up there. It wasn't, a, you know, you know what I mean? It's just, right. it's all, it's all pretty like the entertainment part of wrestling is also the rumor and uh, the, the sound bites and these things. I mean, we, we contribute to that as well here. But the one thing that I think that we try to do that maybe differentiate us from like a dirt sheet is anything that is newsworthy is coming actually out of the wrestler's mouth firsthand. And we're also getting that human interest. I would think the human interest story. I want to know the person behind this thing. Right. So that's the difference between what we do and then what like a, you know, a wrestling news site does or or a wrestling dirt sheet, I should say. I, I stand corrected. So. You know, the the news is when the guy's talking. Now, whether or not he's being honest with us or not, Dennis, that's beyond our control. But if my man, you know, says something and or my, my lady, whatever, um, they say something, then they're 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 supposed to, they're they're responsible for what they said. Right. Listen, uh, we'll get to the rest of the emails next week. We're running short this time. I know it's everybody's favorite, but listen. I went got... long-winded, too. Yeah, well, we've got uh, Johnny Wrestling Perspective Podcast coming on next. So <laughs> uh, stay tuned. He'll be right back with us. And, uh, yeah, we can't wait. Hey. We are back with the Wrestling Perspective, Lars Fredrickson and myself, John Hennigan, MLW, joining us. Uh, a, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, last time you were on the podcast, Lars wasn't here. It was me and Petey Williams. Uh, sadly, Lars took a step down in his career to join the podca podcast, and Petey went to WWE. So things work out for some people. I mean, it works out for me. I get to talk to <laughs> Lars and good for Petey too, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, okay. I'm the only friend that hopes he gets fired so he can come back to a <laughs> shitty podcast. <laughs> Just so you can have your friend back. Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of how that works in yeah. the wrestling business, you know. <laughs> yeah. But listen, let, let's start out the questioning. Um, I I listen to a lot of your interviews. I'm a big fan of yours. And is that we are all of our phones? I guess off? that just happened. Huh? Yeah. Like my wow, phone man. calls go to the computer. <laughs> oh, got it. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you were on last time, you talked about your different uh, incarnations of your name. And I went back, listened to the podcast again. And uh, in, in uh, all your interviews, no one ever asks you. When you sit down with the company, they bring you in and they say, you know what, the, this week you're going to be Johnny WWE Entertainment or Johnny Impact or Johnny whatever. You kind of roll your eyes and go, can we do something different, guys? Do I really need to be Johnny, whatever the name of the show is? You know what? Like I did for a little while, but now it's gone on so long that it's kind of taken on this campy, weird factor that I enjoy a little bit. And when you first start wrestling, or when I did at least, like I made this huge list of all these cool names, like Ulysses, Laser Balls, and whatever, <laughs> like all this crap. Right? You think about all the puns and all the, the, the stuff that you can make out of your names. And then after you do it for a while, you realize like, I mean, that's like very superficial scratching the surface. No one really cares what your name is. They want, they want you, like the story you're going to tell, how you're going to move, what you're going to do. So Johnny Podcast, Johnny Fusion, Johnny Underground, John Hennigan, my real name is what I'm doing in uh, MLW for the first time in a long time. Um, it doesn't bother me at all. And <laughs> there's sometimes when like some promoter is like, I think you should be Johnny Promoter because that's the name of our promotion. What do you think? And I'm always <laughs> like, that's a great idea. <laughs> glad you thought of that let's let's do that that's why you're a promoter man you're smart <laughs> well 
Well, you know, John, like you've been pretty much everywhere and anywhere, you know what I mean? And you've obviously, you know, held a certain level of, you know, respect in, in the business of professional wrestling. It's like, you're not going to be the guy that that's not going to have a job. Um, do you feel like all this experience that you've acquired over this last, I mean, how long have I known you now? Like 12, 13 years, you know? Yeah, I was thinking about that the other day, yeah. You know, and it's like, you've been in like 18 different companies and, you know, you've, you've done it all and you've been back to some of these, you know, um, and you're, it's almost like you're a journeyman, like, like an old great ball player, you know what I mean? So you, you can be put into any situation and it will work. Um, right. Do you attribute that from all the places that you worked or do you think it's just something that your style has allowed you to do? I think both because I would say, say I just stayed with WWE for this entire time. I would still have like a specific set of, sk like set of skills and be the journeyman ball player. Um, I would probably be able to adapt almost anywhere, but because I've worked in Mexico and the UK and all these different companies with different styles, I've had a lot more exposure and experience with all those things. So the, the variety of tools and the toolkit that I'm accustomed to using is, is definitely more. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think anyone who sticks it out in any business, especially in entertainment is forced to figure out how to evolve and should really enjoy doing it and i do like i've got a match on a saturday against ninja mac um never wrestled the guy he's got a very specific style i've, I've watched him but like like what am i going to do against ninja mac and to me that's a fun question like figuring it out and thinking of stuff like kind of like martial arts tricking like a lot of independent like quick like acrobatic stuff. Like, how do I combat that? Do I try to match it? Do I counter it? Like, there's no wrong answer. As long as you're interested, then I think the crowd's going to be interested in what you do. I had dinner the other night with a professional wrestler. I'm not going to say his name because this isn't going to bode well for him. And we're talking about where he's been, what he does, how does he prepare and all that stuff. And he's like, I just go out and do it at this point. I don't even care. When when you travel so much as you have, and now you're starting to wrestle guys like a Min Ninja Mac that you've not seen before, do you sit down and go over the film or tape, or do you go, I've been everywhere, I can get in there and I can do it? How do you you know prepare now for matches with guys that you haven't seen? Um, so believe it or not, I've, I've been YouTubing Ninja Mac. I believe it because because, you because I uh. <laughs> It's it's literally like interesting to me. Mm. And thinking of like it helps me think of different things that I could potentially use to counter or ways that I could work with him. And whether or not that ends up happening is irrelevant, kind of, to like my preparation because I, I really like doing that. So it's the it's motivating because I know this is happening, whether I prepare or not. Like I'm yeah. this on Saturday, it is happening. I can make it as good as I can, or I can not care and just show up. Um, it really sucks to just show up and be somewhere you don't want to be. So, mm. I, and it's not easy to like take the other path and like be really passionate and care all the time, especially when sometimes like the promotion you work for doesn't care about you. But I like fight hard to stay in that mind space. Well, that's one of the things that I think that when I was going back and in, in, um, you know, compared to you to like a journeyman ball player, it, it was out of respect in the sense, because I've seen the way that, you, you know, talking to you now is completely different than talking to you 12 years ago. Does that make sense? Totally. So your, your level of maturity obviously is, is far beyond, you know, where you were at that time. And when you well, talk about it, met, I was, I was in, in that bubble, you know, that's all I had experienced. Right. And, and, and it was younger. Yeah. Yeah. exactly and you were still kind of figuring it out and learning it and now it's like i see you and it's so fluid you can get in there and be so fluid with anybody right so um ninja mac for instance like i know his work pretty well and it's and it's all over the place but it's it it has elements of what you have done in in your career um 
you know, being the more mature now, elder statesman sort of ring general it, at whatever you want to call it. Like, do you go in there and say, hey, Ninja, I think we can do this, this and this and this. Or are you following his lead? I mean, how how do you approach, you know, a guy that you've never worked for? Are you feeling like I you always need ask them first? Like, what do you have in mind? Because if I, I feel like if I go in and say, let's do these five things, usually that's what we'll do. And um, if someone says no, that it, then I'm like, for some reason, like getting offended, even though I shouldn't. But I'm, <laughs> I, you know what I mean? I, I, I want like, I want someone else's ideas. It's like, like, if you ever get sick of listening to your own playlists on Spotify, <laughs> like, I've heard my playlist. I want to, I want to hear someone else's and then add to it, subtract, or maybe that they have an idea I never even thought of that we should do. And then take that and then add. Because if, if you go in there constantly, like, this is going to be John's greatest hits, the same greatest hits I've been playing for 20 years. Like, that's when, I mean, I think that's when, like, guys show up and are like, I'm just here to get paid and head yeah. home, you know, or whatever. Yeah. And then I think it might be time to retire if that's your mentality. Or just find something you're passionate about, you know, whatever that is. Has that always been your attitude or has it changed the longer you've been in the industry? Um, I mean, honestly, like it, it comes in waves. I mean, there's definitely days where I like show up. I'm like, I hate this job. I hate my life choices. <laughs> Why <laughs> did I decide to be a pro wrestler? Um, it's, but I, I try to like keep in that positive mind space and like the creative and keep it as like a creative challenge. And um, for the most part, yes, but like, like nobody honestly can say that they're always positive. That's not how people work. No, I think it's human nature to kind of go back and forth, right? I mean, it's like, yeah, you know, I mean, I, you know, we both do pretty cool gigs and it's like some days you're just, you know, you're a human fucking being, right? Sometimes you just don't want to be right. in fucking Columbus, Ohio, nothing against Columbus, Ohio, or wherever you are you know it doesn't um, exactly i mean even like new york like yeah i, do. I was in uh, i was in london last week and like i forget who I, was, I said i was going to london for a show and uh i think my sister's like oh my god you're going to london i was like yeah but like i'm flying to london for like a day and then i'm flying home I'm not this isn't a vacation <laughs> yeah yeah well it's kind of like i always tell people i've been a million places and seen zero you know what yeah. i mean it's like unless you got a day off or something like that, but even the days off, you're just trying to catch up on sleep and trying to get some nutrition in you. You know what I right. mean? Or, yep. you know, so hundred no, percent, right. Well, but I mean, that's, I guess the life of that we chose. I, I can tell I, you about the gyms in Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> in <Tokyo>. Right. right. <laughs> but I, I mean, I remember one time I went to Tokyo and they wouldn't let me into the gym because I had tattoos. Tattoos. Yeah. You got to cover just, up. I know. And I was like, well, I can't cover it up. It's on my face, you know? Yeah. Um, so we've seen now, I mean, you kind of came in like at the cusp when I would say the business started to change, right? It, got, it became a little bit more, less about uh, psychology. It was The psychology changed, I should say. The storytelling aspect changed um, in a lot of ways. And it became more sort of uh influenced by independent wrestling right and you right. kind of were like there when it's as it was changing and now you're seeing it that we have so many different promotions you got you know aew out on which is like an indie show a lot in a lot of ways you've got impact wrestling you've got mlw you've got wwe of course we probably will always have that there's new there's now japanese companies that have american exposure on american tv channels um, there's so much for GCW. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. You can consume wrestling anytime that you want, seven days a week, 24-7. Literally. You, yeah. I mean, how do you still keep up with, with wrestling? Like, are you still like a fan? Are you still like, you know, I, I still kind of watch this certain show or, or is it more like my opponent, I'm going to watch his shit and that's about as far as I'm going to go. Um. To the extent that I can be a fan, yeah. Like if I like say like the uh the final of the best of seven matches between the Lucha Brothers and the Elite on AEW, 
I had to watch. Like, right. and there's there's just certain matches that some like a friend of mine will say like, Dude, you got to check out like Omega versus Osprey, like or whatever it is. Like, and I'll I'll do that. But like you said, if you tried to watch all the wrestling that's out there, I mean that literally would be 27 like or 24 hours a day seven days a week. there's so much out there yeah but well, it's, speaking it's of tough because i am a fan of it and, and like pick it like pick and choose what i what i watch though right. well you know all this wrestling you're with mlw now and uh, they've been amazing to us we're big fans of theirs and they do this new kind of a mold together now with like a lucha underground which you know I, I I'm a Lucha Underground nerd. I love that show. Me too. When when you come into MLW, you see this kind of the hybrid of it. Are you in your mind hoping that they may tend to go a little bit more Lucha Underground because the storytelling, the production, it was something we'd not seen in wrestling at that time, and they tease us right now with it in MLW. Just so much more. It's almost like just show me your boobs. I want to see it all. Uh, when you go in, here's, here's the thing. So, so honestly, like Lucha Underground will be near impossible to replicate because that was an hour long drama on the LA network with a sizable budget. And really, what that means is time, right? So we had we shot the vignettes in, in Lucha Underground like a like a TV show, like an episodic with takes and angles, which is why it looked like how it did. Um, most promotions don't have either the money or the time. If you don't, if you're a smaller promotion, you don't have the money. And if you're WWE or AEW, you're you're live, right? So you don't really have the time to like do something and then edit it and post and then put it out there. Um, with MLW, I love that they have uh, Cesar Duran, known as Dario Cueto, really whose name is Luis. Uh, he's a fantastic actor. I mean, and and also like a really good dude. <laughs> I'll sidetrack and tell a quick story about him. Me, uh, Taya, and him, and um, this girl he was dating. We're going on this double date because he tells us he has a sailboat and he knows how to sail. Parked in Marina Del Rey. Like, when's the last time you sailed, Luis? Oh, you know, I've had the boat three years, but I haven't sailed it in you know maybe two years. Okay. So somehow, like, he hits, like, three boats on the way out of Marina Del Rey. Like, just, like, little thing. <laughs> His date is, like, oh, my, like, freaking out the whole time. I think it's hilarious. Ty is laughing. Then, like, the channel to get out to the open water is, like, a football, 100 yards. We get pinned up against the rocks somehow. And now, <laughs> like... Taya is like yelling at all these fishermen in, in Spanish and they're trying to push us off with their fishing poles. And um, Luis is like trying to like calm his date down and keeps going like, we're having a good time, right? <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> having a good time. This is fun, right? And the Coast Guard shows up. I jumped off the boat and was trying to push it off the rocks with my feet to save like the hull from getting punctured. <laughs> and they towed us off and like we went out sailing. Um, the girl he brought like stayed below deck and cried and then <laughs> the other three of us were up there we had some shots and just had kind of a really nice day <laughs> um because it doesn't really have much to do with with him aside from just uh being an, an adventurous like fun guy to be around but he takes the his craft very seriously and that's storytelling acting so he lends a lot of authenticity what he needs to be used effectively is a good story and a, a story that like has continuity and just doesn't like end or change for some reason like for some reason happens at all these places that have plenty of money and should be able to afford at least writers or have the means to pay off their storylines so with him as an asset i think he elevates whoever he's on the screen with and with MLW, yeah, I am hoping that like they kind of can go more that way with the knowledge that there's no way that they can go as far as Lucha Underground unless they get some sort of like financial deal or big time money because it's impossible to compete with that money. Well, it sounds like he's really passionate about his craft, just not his watercraft. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> 
Sorry, I've been saving that, that one for good. the last five minutes. Thanks. Um, you, did you just say that's a good one, John? You don't have to lie to him. No, I'm not lying. I like horrible <laughs> jokes. That's my wife. <laughs> I mean, Johnny Drip Drip, America's yeah. Moist Wanted. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've been saying this for a long time now. MLW, Impact Wrestling are the pure wrestling TV shows, if you like professional wrestling. And, you know, when you went over there, I really honestly thought to myself that you think of yourself as a pro wrestler, not a sports entertainer. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, except the those two terms, I don't distinguish between too much anymore. And it's because um, if you spend enough time working for WWE and you're there for the meeting that they have every year or two where it's like, we're not damn professional wrestlers. We're sports entertainers. Nobody say pro wrestling. And then we're not sports entertainers. We're entertainers. We're just entertainers. <laughs> I mean, we're all pro wrestlers or luchadors, or sport, whatever the whatever the term is. Um, but I know what you mean, the distinction between the two. Like, there's like a certain craft that... Um, Dr. Dre said once in an interview, like when someone asked him like why he does what he does or how he creates his music. And he just said like, I just try to think of whatever will pop the house. And to me, that's, yes, like that's what pro wrestling should be. You should be trying to pop the house and that can't just be with spots or with a flashy entrance or with like a Goldberg character that just smashes everybody. It's gotta be with like a really authentic, thoughtful, relatable character used in a, in a good story. Mm. And um, the more tools you have, like physically on the mic, whatever, like the more nuanced you can make your stuff. Right. Last time you were on, you talked about a wrestling ring in your backyard. And here we are several years later now. Uh, a, do you still have it in your backyard or a shed sure. or whatever? <laughs> John Hennigan keeps a wrestling ring. Quick, quick answer to that one. Um, one of my wedding vows was that we would no longer have any pro wrestling roommates, to which uh, Luchasaurus and Super Panda stood up and said, like, hey, what are you talking about? <laughs> and B, we would no longer have a wrestling ring in the backyard. So uh, <laughs> no, 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 there's no wrestling ring in the backyard. <laughs> but I honestly miss it. Well, how does your prep now change the older you get? I've listened to a couple of interviews where you've talked about, you know, you you had an injury and your sidekick was affected. And it got me thinking about how do you prep now or train? Do you, do you still go hardcore the older you get? Do you scale it back? What's, what's the difference now in your wrestling training? Um. I think it's basically just you have to train a lot more intelligently. The intensity can remain, but I don't flip onto hard surfaces anymore. Like if I go to a center, I still flip, but I'll flip onto like not even just one mat, like a mat in like a foam pit. So the landing is really soft because even a spring floor, like I could flip on that all day when I was 20. But now, like, even if I hit a flip perfectly, like at 43, I hit 20 side flips perfectly on a spring floor, I'm going to start to mess up my knees and my ankles. And I know that. But if you don't do any, then you start to lose your, your skill. So I think it's basically just got to be equally intense, if not more intense, which is annoying because the older you get, the, the harder it is to stay in shape but far, um, far more intelligent. And like, you can't take, like I don't take risks on stuff that I don't know if I can do or not. Like I don't try like a springboard shooter just for the first time in a ring. Like I, I might try it in a center in a foam pit if I, for some reason wanted to, I don't. <laughs> but but um, I know that like, even if I did hit it, I might hurt my like ankle or my knee. And if I missed it, there's a really good chance I'd mess myself up for a really dumb reason. Fair enough. Your last WWE run, it seemed like, you know, you were there for, you were there for a, a, almost like a cup of coffee, right? And the next time that we see you, really see you is now with MLW. 
Um, do you ever, is that like the goal for you is like to, to always get back to the WWE or is it more about being like, um, you know, a creative, is it more art artistry for you now is what I'm trying to get at. Is it like, are you it's more hundred percent artistry? And like for a while, like when I left WWE the first time, it was never my goal to go back. It was in my head that I would go back one day. It's not really in my head anymore that like I need to be back in WWE ever. If like it happened for some reason, sure, maybe. But the chance to have like maybe like the handful of dream matches that I, that I haven't had yet against who knows, like Omega or Moxley or Abushi or people like that um <laughs> or maybe even my wife in a hair versus hair match or something oh, like yeah. some crazy like thing like that like that's way more exciting to me than thinking about like i want to work here or i want to work there you know right right zombies uh i wasn't gonna bring it up but <laughs> since we talked about this uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I turn on the TV and there you are in a ring with zombies. Um, I'm not sure if there's a question there, but do you just go, what the fuck? Zombies? <laughs> Guys, really? That's what we're doing here? Zombies? Um, that Basically, that's it. I <laughs> I heard about the match and I told uh, Damian Priest like what we were doing. And like, um, he like walked over to Miz and was like, and like, the fuck's John talking about? Some weird shit. Like, he said we're having a zombie lumberjack match. Is he fucking with me? Is he just making them work? <laughs> what? <laughs> um, to be honest, I I loved it. Just <laughs> it's so weird, and like, it doesn't make any sense. But then again, like wrestling doesn't have to make sense. So we we both got ate by zombies and then just came back the week after. Yeah. Okay. No one else. Zombies only cared about you two guys, and that was it. Like they were, do they roam the halls? Do you guys have to fight them off and leave them locked in, and then they come out at the? How do you? How do you? The craziest part of that whole day was like there's this this one zombie that like followed me around for like five minutes. And kept kind of like touching me, and I didn't want to be rude, so I was finally like, "Get the fuck away from me, bro!" And um, <laughs> it was Scotty Too Hotty, and he was just, no way. Yeah, a, he was he had such good makeup on that I didn't know it was him, and I was trying to be really polite because I didn't know who these people were, and I knew that they had spent hours in like this prosthetic makeup stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fucking Scotty Too Hotty. Scotty, yeah. Oh, bro, that would he, he like so got me so good that day. That would have been so badass. Like, you know, during match, he just bucks, busts out the worm and shit. You know what I mean? Like uh, a right? zombie worm. Yeah, opportunities. Uh. The zombies totally should have gone over. <laughs> <laughs> well, they didn't. Uh, they, they, you know, but no, it's funny because it's like, I think that when that happened, it was one of the more, most talked about things that have has happened in wrestling, both either a positive way or in a negative way. And it's like, I guess that's the whole point, right? Is to try to get people talking and maybe, you know, yeah. that was the whole, the whole concept from the beginning, but now you're, you're acting, you're doing movies, you're doing these things. And it's like, you know, what's this latest thing that you're doing here? Um, so on our honeymoon, uh, Ty and I wrote a script called the iron Sheik massacre. Mm -hmm. And um, it's basically like we wanted to kind of like make make something together, collaborate on something. Um, I've always been a big fan of uh, of Kazro Vaziri, a.k.a. the man known as Aaron Sheik. And I met him a bunch while I was with WWE. But there's one time in 2014 where his nephew called and asked me to push him down the red carpet of the SBs in his wheelchair. And um, I, I was kind of in a rut at the time. But uh, of course, they said, yeah, absolutely. So. I'm pushing him in his wheelchair and um, Sheik is having a great time. He's doing his shtick. He's yelling at people like, hey, you're wrong, you're reporter. I suplex you, I break your back, I make you humble. Some people know who he is. Some people don't. Like, right. But if they don't know who he is, they just see a guy in a wheelchair with all these war medals and probably assume he might be an ambassador or something or <laughs> somebody that they don't want to piss off. So right. they just deal with it. And we get done and I'm like, man, like, 
he seemed like so happy all night. Like why? They can, and I'm like, I'm not in a wheelchair. I'm fine. I'm healthy. Like, I, like what is it about that? And I thought like, is it because he likes like popping the boys? And that's one answer, but then I thought deeper. And I think really it was about him being like the best version of himself. And at heart, he's an entertainer. And that night he got to entertain his friends, me, uh, the Megan boys, Shad Gaspar, JTG. We were all there in this group and he was like on fire having a good night. And I think that's what it was. Like he was being the best version of himself and he really enjoyed that. And it took me, I didn't just come to that epiphany overnight. It was just me kind of thinking about that. And then, so when you think about his career, I was thinking about like, man, like he was champion for a month in 1983, one month. He was an Olympic wrestler from Iran. He turned down like a million dollars to break Hulk Hogan's leg instead of losing the title to him which was in 1983. Who knows what that'd be worth now? Um, he just has, a, it was a guy that had experienced like higher highs and lower lows than me. And is still like this, like kind of like happy dude. Um, so I think the movie kind of was a love letter to him and the business and exploring that type of thing. And there's a lot of guys and I've been there too, that get bitter and, like think about like, oh, like the old timers had it easy or this or that without thinking like no one ever has it easy. It's always hard. It's hard for the new guys. It's hard for the guys that started. And um, the Iron Sheep Massacre basically kind of addresses that, but is really about a doll that becomes sentient and murders a house full of disrespectful new school wrestlers. That's a weird conclusion to jump to off that story, but that's kind of the impetus behind everything you just swerved me i'm sitting here no. listening to this heartwarming story i'm like man this is going to be so great and then you're like eh, this machine kills a bunch of people well if you think about it is he he's an entertainer at heart right yeah like like i don't know if like i mean i don't know if a really like like heart, heartfelt touching documentary he does have one by the way of of the of him and his life and detailing all of his deeds is what he wants. I don't know if that's what I would want. Right. Or would you rather just have some like crazy thing that makes people laugh and is fun to watch? I, I agree. And you, you're doing this movie, you're training for boxing. Uh, you are the MLW national champion. Do you worry now? I'm going to jump into boxing because I, I, you've been training for it, and I, I'm excited to see how how that goes, but. You see a lot of these athletes, they jump into another sport, doesn't quite go as well for them, and then it affects their wrestling career. Do you worry that whatever happens in that boxing ring, whether you win or lose, could affect how you're seen in the wrestling industry to fans? Uh, I think it'll definitely affect how I'm seen. But the nice thing about wrestling is if I completely embarrass myself and get destroyed – um, I probably get pretty good heat <laughs> when I show up. <laughs> um, and if I win, then I, I don't know. If, actually, if I win, I don't know if people are going to like give me a standing ovation for winning in a YouTube boxing event anyway. <laughs> but um, personally, like, uh, I don't want to lose because I've been training for this thing and it would hurt the ego to lose. But I'm not too worried about how it'll affect my career. You know, I just saw your wife wrestle last weekend in impact and, you know, you're obviously, you guys are in two different companies um, doing your, your craft. She's an MLW too. Well, I thought she was both. Both. Yeah. 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 She's both. Yeah. Yeah. So Sorry. my point, my, my well, what I was trying to get at is like being married to a professional wrestler. Was this something that you feel like you needed? To, this is this is kind of like the perfect partnership. You know what I mean? Is as far as like, well, she kind of understands what I do, what what I am. I mean, is that part of the of the thing that makes it work? I know exactly what you're you mean. Um, yes, 
but there's like pros and cons, right? Like I can talk to her about specifics of wrestling psychology and bounce ideas off her in a way that most people can't with their partner. Um, but sometimes there's no separation, like no time off if we're with together all the time or we're on the same Australia tour, which is great. But sometimes like you want your own space. Um, I've dated wrestlers before her and people outside the business and they both both worked, but for some reason with her, it worked out the best because our histories were so different that I feel like we had very different views and ways that we got into the business and we had something in common, clearly wrestling and enough like out of common that it felt like we we're both kind of like living our own dreams that overlap, but they're also kind of different. Well, I, I, the reason why I asked that question is because we've had wrestlers who are married, obviously Jordan Grace, Jonathan Gresham, you know, and, and it's always curious to me because, you know, I don't necessarily know if I'd want to date another musician, like, you know what I mean? So, but hundred percent. And like, but, I've also realized like, um, the last thing that she wants to hear from me is a critique on like her <laughs> man. Yeah, and like, I might have some valid points and she <laughs> has some valid points on my matches, right. but like when we're finally back at the hotel room, like I don't feel like laying down in bed and having her say like, you know, like, you know, when you kicked out of that falsy, your shoulders run all the way up and then you kind of like laid there for a little bit too long. No, I don't want to analyze anything anymore. Like this is time to just like chill and relax. Right. And, um, <sighs> Yeah, it's it's tricky, and I think it's a balancing act. But as as long as like both people are on the same page of like, you know, like we're people first, wrestlers second, then you're okay. Right, and I know that that's it's a superficial question to ask because obviously there's friendship and love there. It has to be, and otherwise it doesn't work. Period. Doesn't matter what your profession is. It's just always curious to me. But then again, Dennis. So anyways, uh, do you, do you, um, we talked about your wrestling career, you're venturing out into all these other, uh, projects. What do you see your wrestling career going forward now is like producing something that's interests you or when you're done, you're done with wrestling and we're not going to see you show up for 19 last match, John Hennigan last matches or this month. Yeah, I, I've got it. You know what he could do? He could come back to every company and wrestle under the moniker. You get what I'm saying? So he Ooh. could have. 150 John Morrison's final match. Yes. Impact's final match. Yeah. Johnny Promoter, bro. Yep. Well, now I got to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything that you get good at, I mean, you get like uh, trapped in a way because I'm not as good at anything as I am at professional wrestling. Um, I haven't spent as much time doing anything as I have professional wrestling, like thinking about it, practicing it, do like doing it. And there's an expiration date on your body because it's a physical activity. Um, if I distill down what I like about it the most, it's I really enjoy the physical creativity, which unfortunately won't be able to go on forever. But creativity isn't something that has to go away and neither does storytelling. So whether it's producing for wrestling or some other form of storytelling, which would be filmmaking or TV, like creating content of, of some kind, um, or maybe even um, some sort of like fitness training center. They're all things that are like floating around in, in my mind as as things that I, I could see myself becoming passionate about it's that question though is uh the toughest thing to answer that's why we asked it um <laughs> the first time i left wwe i was uh signing at a convention and first of all some dude like reaches underneath like my legs and grabs my dick and i turned it around i was pissed scotty too hotty <laughs> Jake Snake. It was Jake Snake. And I was like, I was like, hey, was like, hey, Johnny. 
you got to ask yourself, what do you want? Like he just said it like that and walked off. And I was like, that had to be like the weirdest like 30 seconds because I wasn't literally thinking that. And then like, who does that? Who does, like I, I didn't even know that well. <laughs> but he really like nailed it. And like that that question that you could ask to anybody, like, what do you want? Like, and it can't just be like money or power. Like it has to be like a real answer. And if you can figure that question out, like you can figure out a lot of what you should be spending your time on. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, and then having Jake the Snake fucking grab you by your sack and ask you the same thing that you're thinking about. I mean, we're talking about a master of psychology here. I know. Um, he got me. He How's got you, bro. Movie? I know. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, John, where, where can people find you? Like, uh, what's your Instagram, Twitter? Where, where can they find you? You can find me on Instagram at John Hennigan. That's my shoot name on Twitter at The Real Morrison. Facebook, John Morrison, um, the Iron Sheik Massacre is currently playing in film festivals. It'll probably be released in a few months and available on um, SVOD, all the streaming services and places like that. And make sure to watch Creator Clash 2, April 15th, where I'm having an officially sanctioned boxing fight against Harley from Epic Mealtime. It's the weirdest thing ever. <laughs> So <laughs> the only place that I could see the Iron Sheik Massacre is by going out and trying to find it at a movie theater at this point. Current, uh, at a film festival, yeah. And okay. we're, we're probably going to wind that down and then gear up for a release and putting it out somewhere. But um, that's another thing that we're kind of like weighing options and trying to figure out right now. Okay. It was originally designed as a pitch for a longer um, project. But it like snowballed into this 24 minute thing that's pretty epic and everyone really likes it. And I, think I can't wait to see it. it out. I can't wait. Too to bad it. you don't know anybody that could get you like a secret link that uh, like Fox Searchlight sends people to watch with like the watermarks on it. And I know. wish I I wish I knew a guy. I <sighs> wish that's that's gonna be rough. Well, but I, I mean. If I find Johnny Secret Link, I'll, I'll connect you guys. <laughs> Johnny Secret. <laughs> Johnny Secret Link, bro. Uh, yeah. Don't forget, you can always catch him on MLW Tuesday nights, I believe, 10 p.m. on Reels. I know MLW is going to be in New York City April 6th and Philly April 8th. Uh, so we can't wait to see you. Not that neither one of us are close to Philly or New York, but, you know. <laughs> Come to nice thing to say. Yeah. But, <laughs> a good way to um, wrap up the show. <laughs> I'm just, you know, the one thing is like, I, that's the thing with MLW. It's like, I come out to the West coast. Let's go. You know? Yeah. Too bad Corb Bauer doesn't watch this podcast. Wink, 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 wink. <laughs> or think of all the travel you'd save on your West coast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. At least two people. Yeah. <laughs> We could just build a whole like promotion around people that I'll do a whole trip. hour of MLW if I don't have to fly to Philly. <laughs> <laughs> Iron Man match there. Yes. Well, oh, thanks. Husband and th wife. Yeah, never mind. Okay. <laughs> I, the, I know the 60 minutes. See, okay, last question. You and the wife in a match. What's the match? What's the stipulation and who's going over? Um, so it's happened twice. And basically, we've done two of these. Um, holy matrimony, the dirty dishes match. She comes out and says, yeah, you promised me a lot of things uh, when we got married. And I've noticed since we've been married, you haven't done one dish. And to prove it, I brought out the dishes. Aww. And then we carved out all the dishes. And um, basically, the loser has to do the winner's dishes for a year. I'm 0-2. <laughs> but a but hell of a dishwasher <laughs> but uh, yeah that's another skill johnny dishwasher that's yeah <laughs> See, after this podcast dishwasher. that's what you will be doing <laughs> we, we have that's a all you of, got bro yeah, we're called yep. we're called lars and dennis career killer <laughs> welcome to the show well johnny wants to stay married too so i guess i'll do it oh, yeah. <laughs> johnny so, suck uh, it down <laughs> <laughs> wow listen thank you so much for hanging out with us we truly appreciate it uh we put together a list of guys we wanted your name was like on top of that list lars is like let me make a phone call and here you are so we really appreciate I'm glad you, you called us. yeah thank you 